Well, welcome, my friend. Welcome to Real Vision. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, I must admit, this has been one of the interviews I've most looked forward to in the last several years. So there's no pressure on you then. Well, uh, yeah, no, no pressure at all, it sounds like. <laughs> um, look, without, I obviously don't want to dox you in any way, but I'd love to hear, just go back a little bit about the history of how you got into the crypto space, how it hit your radar screen, what was your kind of lens of perspective at the time? And then we'll move forwards a bit from there to get to some of your major perspectives now. Sure. No, and now I'll, I'll try and do this. I won't be able to give the full picture because it will dox me, <laughs> yep. but I can, I'll stay a little bit conceptual about um, some of the things that I thought were interesting before. And then I think with that as background, it becomes very interesting to consider how those lead to where we are today and what I think the linkage is, because I do think it is a straight line linkage from where I started in crypto. Fantastic. I came across crypto seriously for the first time in summer of 2013. I had actually come across Bitcoin in 2011, but didn't take it seriously enough. I was uh, thinking, oh, look, this is for the people who want to keep gold bars in their basement because, you know, the government's going to take their guns or something, right? Like it, it, it had that aesthetic in 2011, and I, it was a painful mistake. I didn't take it seriously. It came back on my radar screen in 2013, and in 2013, I read the white paper. And I said, oh, oh, that's a big deal. I downloaded a node. I bought my first Bitcoin. I called up a buddy who lived on the other side of the planet and told him to download a node. And I sent him $20 worth of Bitcoin. And that's fine. That was probably 0.2 Bitcoin back then. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting because he was... I was in New York then, he was in Europe. It was Saturday afternoon. And if you wanted to send a wire transfer to Europe on Saturday afternoon, of course you can't, right? You're waiting until Monday, depending on where it's going. If it's running through a correspondent bank, it will be there on Wednesday, most likely. And you know the wire transfer fees themselves are gonna be $30. And so we're sitting there, we're playing around with it. I'm saying, all right, I'm sending you 20 bucks. and. It's just there. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. That it's kind of surprising how that worked. And then I started getting really into it. And I don't know how much, you know, the audience or you remember from that era, but there was fall 2013 was kind of the first blossoming of uh, crypto Twitter. Like, the it's when it started going in mainstream is not the right word but it's when a lot of the i think the big thinkers on crypto twitter coalesced in that period right and so it was a very intellectually fertile period when we went from being like well what is this and what does it do and what does it all mean right and for me the conclusion then was not that this is a great way to send remittances. I mean, it is, sure. Or, oh, it's an inflation hedge. And I mean, sure, that's fine, but there's other inflation hedges in the world, right? Like, it's not the only way you can hedge inflation. Mm -hmm. It was a much deeper idea, right? And it's a much deeper idea technically, but it's a much deeper idea socially. The technical deeper idea is the following. It has solved, under certain parameters, a major problem in distributed systems and computer science, the Byzantine general's problem. How people who don't know each other, who don't trust each other, can coordinate, can agree on a set of facts. That is a very, very big deal. That's number one. The implication of that, though, is you now have, in a digital era, which is, we've been in a digital era for decades, you now have a way where you can have, store a set of information, not in the database. And this was my big aha moment from even back then, where you don't think about it, but all modern society runs on databases. Your life is organized by thousands of databases. Where you, which hotel you can check into, 
which Uber you can step into, um, where you're allowed to vote, how much money is in your bank account, how much money is in your stockbroker account. Literally thousands of databases organize your life, right? It is something that's happened in the last 50 years, right? Before computers, right? before widespread computers, and before the internet, this was not as important a part of human society. And now it is integral for running any modern society. Any modern society runs on a database connected to the internet. And in fact, thousands of databases connected to the internet. We take it for granted as completely obvious because that's really the only way to do it. And what that means is that there are thousands of TTPs around you, trusted third parties, people who you're in effect uh, trusting as a counterparty for some set of information. That set of information is how much money is in your bank account or do you own this piece of property or are you a citizen of this republic? And, you know, like most centralized systems, it works okay, right? Centralized systems, most of the time, are better, right? It's not, and this is, I think, one of the things that a lot of people get wrong early in crypto. The, you're even seeing this now with, like, big Web2 CEOs who are saying, well, no, why would you use a blockchain for anything? It's slower. It's more expensive. It's this. Look at my super fast database running on Amazon Web Services. And I mean, all that's true, of course, right? Like, that's, of course, not the point. Right? The point is not about how many transactions per second you, you, you have. The point is, what are the structural social implications of this? And the structural social implications of these are, generically, you're trusting someone. And specifically, as we have become progressively digital, you're trusting a smaller number of larger entities. Right? One of the big surprises of the internet for anyone who was around the first go around to me is the following. We, I remember I was just old enough to remember when the internet started becoming prominent and the whole idea was going to decentralize everything, right? Look, you don't, you don't have to be the New York Times to publish online, right? Anyone can publish online. And that turned out to be, you don't have to be Walmart to sell things online. Anyone can sell online. And while that's true, and initially you had a lot of small businesses, because there are no distribution barriers online, you ended up with bigger oligopolies than you had offline, right? And so the internet tends to be somehow at the application level centralized, mm -hmm. right? Big data, machine learning tends to be centralizing. Um, there's economies of scale, there's economies of scope, there's economies of data. All of this leads to centralization. And then blockchains appear, Bitcoin appears, really. Not blockchains, Bitcoin, you say, huh. So that's like, I mean, among other things, a bank account without a bank, right? And it's just, it's a bank being run by a bunch of people who don't know each other and don't need to know each other and don't need to, except for certain assumptions, don't need to trust each other, right? And my conclusion very early on was, oh, this is a 30, 40 year big deal. You can re-architect whole chunks of how society works with this. We suddenly have a second tool in the digital era. Before we had one tool, a great tool, an amazing tool. The database is a great tool, right? This is not like, Everything should be on a blockchain. In fact, I remember there was once a graphic that was a little infographic that says uh, decision tree. And it's, it has, it's the question, does this, should this be in a blockchain? If you have to ask, the answer is no, right? Like, yeah. you know, blockchain's not an all purpose replacement for all databases. Databases make a lot of sense in many cases, but they might be a replacement for the important things, right? So this and I have both a traditional finance background. I have a software development background. I have a big corporate background, let's say, but I've also been since 2013 quite active in the crypto world and quite active in education, outreach, advocacy, reaching out to people, like this type of thing. Like I believe 
the types of things you see on my Twitter account now are the things that I've been harassing everyone about for eight years, <laughs> right? It's not, it's just now under a different handle, right? So one of the things that was frustrating me though through this period, so Bitcoin and then Ethereum and then the whole ecosystem succeeded financially, I think beyond anyone's wildest dreams in 2013, mm -hmm. right? The types of numbers people thought we'd see 20 years from now, in 2013, we saw five and seven and eight. And so the number went up. Everyone was happy. This is great. And I kept getting stuck on the following. And I've had this discussion over and over and over again with my friends in the crypto world. Like, okay, so what other applications have we built? Why um, I have at times run organizations of different sizes, including fairly sizable ones. And I wake up in the morning and say, well, I believe in this more than anything else. And how can I use crypto at work? But the answer was like, I mean, how can I use Bitcoin at work? Yeah, I can't be. really. I mean, it's a payment system. Okay. But like, is it the right answer to this application? No, the database is the right answer to the application. All right. And so you say, well, I feel there's a there there. I feel there's another turn there. And of course, Ethereum with smart contracts was another term, and you know, DeFi is another term, but they're still not exactly hitting core societal systems, right? And so that's the background, let's say, through a year and a half. Um, that's the kind of intellectual background through a year and a half ago. Let me take a pause there, see if that makes sense. Yeah, look, it makes total sense. A very similar journey to my own. It was 2012, I probably saw it in 2011. 2012, I started properly digging into it. And I come through the lens of almost losing the European banking system after we'd almost lost the global banking system in 2008. And I realized very quickly that Bitcoin itself was interesting, but the blockchain itself was going to offer a whole lot of um, solutions to some of the huge problems in the world. And one of the big problems was ownership. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, and I started... Immediately, I was good friends with um, Emil Woods and Chad Cascarilla, um, and they got me across the line very quickly in terms of this. And then, okay, well, what you can start to put on the blockchain, you know, what's relevant, and what's not. As you said, that journey was a journey where I realized, like you, that it, it was okay that in 2014, 15, there weren't that many applications because we knew they'd come. It was just a matter of when. And yeah, I think your journey is super interesting because it's your mixed background gives you, you know, that it gives you a, a massive advantage in this space. You know, I was not a technologist. I had to get up some of the curve of that. You know, I was a finance guy, but you having that mixed background must have been a huge help. So 18 months ago, NFTs, which we all knew about, you know, any of us have been around the space mm -hmm. for a while, we knew about, but it kind of came in a different format than many of us first thought. I kind of thought it might be through property or some sort of other form of IP, but it didn't. Talk me through that realization when the world suddenly changed again. Well, as with Bitcoin, but even more so, I, NFTs was a two-part process. The 2017, oh yeah, look at this. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, anyway, this is goofy. Let's get back to the real work of, I don't know, making smart contracts or whatever we're doing, right? Like this was, this was a distraction. I didn't get, I didn't get it the first time. Yeah. All right. It goes on the, just like Bitcoin 11 goes on the L list, NFTs 2017 goes on the L list. I was like, oh, that's cool. Because I wasn't like opposed to it. I wasn't a right click save as. I was like, well, okay, that's fun, but not particularly important. Right. So something like that was the first go around. And it wasn't until I can't tell you exactly what the trigger was. I don't remember now, but I remember towards the end of 2020, I started getting that spidey sense. And I started harassing all of my crypto friends, including some who are just like true crypto. Oh, geez. And I'm like, I think there's something important here. And they're like, no, it's stupid. 
right? It's cartoons, right? Like it's, you know, let's look at this new blockchain that does whatever, right? And I'm saying, okay. And I kept, and then I'd wait a month and then it was still nagging at me. And then finally I said, you know, I, I need to spend time on it. Like it's bothering me. And I said, let's go buy some NFTs. And the very first NFT I bought was like 0.01 ETH or something, right? It was just like, let me just buy the cheapest NFT I can buy on OpenSea and see how I feel. I was like, oh, that was interesting. That was fun. Let me buy another one. Well, okay, that feels pretty good. Let me buy another one. And then I started bringing. But hold on, before we go friends, on, what the hell were you buying? And why did it appeal? Random, and why did it appeal to you? Random, 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 random. I, I literally said, like, okay, like, it's, I learn by doing. That's my, yeah. you know, I have a gut. And then I don't believe people can understand anything without doing it. Right. And I think one of the huge gaps we have with traditional system people and with regulators, they've never done it. And so like their, their image of what Bitcoin is, their image of what Web3 is, their image of what NFTs are, is this wholly distorted image. So I didn't know if I wanted to invest in NFTs and I also wanted to like spend some time. So I just went, I don't even remember what the first one was. It was like, it was a little, it was some pixelated character because of course it was, but it was the furthest thing from an important collection, right? Like it was not, let's go buy Grail NFTs. It's let me play around in OpenSea for a bit. And what started happening was the following. And this was a very new experience. As I would grab a friend of mine, a family member, and would say, hey, let's try this. Pick something. I'll buy it. Here, set up a MetaMask. I'll send it to you and send it back to me. What I realized within a month this is crypto's consumer moment. It is a well-known truism in technology that technologies become consumerized when you stop talking about the technology. I had spent eight years trying to convince people of the joys of decentralization. The whole time, I've had this thought in the back of my mind. I'm like, I know this is wrong. I can't tell you why it's wrong, but I know it's wrong because I'm talking about the Byzantine general's problem. I know it's wrong because we're discussing the differences between how Solana reaches consensus and how Ethereum reaches consensus. And of course, I personally find it very interesting, but this is nerd stuff, right? This is not consumer stuff. Yeah. Though one of the ways I think about it, you know, Instagram uses, I'm sure, Python and machine learning and cloud computing and routers and servers, but no one in the history of the world said, hey, you should use this cool Instagram app. It uses Python, right? That's not how consumer tech works. And what I noticed for the very first time in crypto, here we were absolutely using decentralized rails, true crypto, Ethereum, right? Web3 applications. And we weren't talking about the tech except for the basic kind of ramp up curve to like, here's how MetaMask works, right? Once we got past that, it was, oh, this one's cool. That's one cool. I want the one with the silly hat. I want this photograph. Oh, we are we, we are humans after all. Correct, but that's tech in and of itself isn't interesting, right? Tech is interesting to meet human needs, right? And so I was like, oh wow, this this is it. This is um, the positive way to say it. The classic way to say it is this is how crypto consumerizes. The kind of inside baseball way to think about it this could be a Trojan horse for decentralized rails, right? You, we know this eight years in, no one cares about decentralization per se. And I say this and it's a harsh statement, it's but it's true. true. It's true. Uh, I think if you went and checked, even the large majority of Twitter slash crypto slash Silicon Valley thought leaders on decentralization have the majority of their crypto in like Coinbase custody or something, right? Which means like everyone's LARPing, right? They, everyone, 
You can't say I care about decentralization and say, oh, I am the third party custodian. The threat model is exactly the same as being at JP Morgan. There's no difference. No. That is Bitcoin as a financial investment, not Bitcoin as a different way to organize things. Yeah. Right. And Bitcoin as a financial investment has been extremely fruitful to early Bitcoin people. Right. But with the exception of, and I, you know, it's funny because the Bitcoin maxi narrative has been in some ways hijacked relative to what it is in my mind, right? Like the, the maxi narrative is that like, you know, I don't know, the today maxi narrative is that all other coins are scams and we have to all eat steaks or something, right? Like that, <laughs> oh, yeah. That's not the Bitcoin maxi narrative. The Bitcoin maxi narrative is you need to run your own node. Yeah. You need to be self-sovereign. You need to like do the education to learn how to be responsible for yourself, right? And those OG Bitcoiners, I have infinity respect for because they're the only ones who are actually doing it. Yeah. Right? Like the there's a lot of people who say, oh, this is what Bitcoin's a good investment, but none of them are actually doing this. And it's interesting, I'll I'll flag this because it'll be interesting as we get through the rest of this. Up until late last year, and I think this is shocking to some people who, including some Bitcoiners who come across my feed and then, you know, like, I can't believe he's buying monkey photos or something. What is this guy? Right. Like, I was close to, from a portfolio allocation perspective, a year and a half ago, close to a Bitcoin maxi. Like, okay. it has been the, through eight years of altcoins, ICOs, other things, about the only thing that has gotten me to sell Bitcoin is NFTs. It's interesting. I flagged that. I flagged that of interest. So consumerization. Now, consumerization has another aspect. The first aspect is that people like it and it's not about the technology. The second aspect that's very, very different is that every organization on the planet has an incentive to mint an NFT. So I was in and around NFT NYC, I didn't go to the conference for obvious reasons, but I was around. And I went to the Dolce Gabbana party. And the interesting thing, that was the most interesting thing about the conference, because specifically there was a Dolce Gabbana party. I've been to many crypto conferences. Dolce Gabbana does not show up to like <laughs> Ethereum conferences. No. Right? I also assume, I'm not sure, but I assume Dolce Gabbana does not throw parties at Cisco Network Administrator Conferences either. I still right? doubt it. Right. Why would they? But NFTs can represent anything and everything. And anything and everything also includes Dolce Gabbana dresses. And Dolce Gabbana has an incredible brand equity. They have a customer base. And so they can monetize that with a 90-something percent gross margin product, as they did. And they, as they should have. And Nike bought Artifact, Adidas did their drop. We're going to have every single fashion lifestyle company issue NFTs in the coming months and years. It will then roll over to the consumer packaged goods companies. You'll have a QR code on your six pack of Coke. You'll scratch it, you'll get an NFT. Why? Because then they can directly airdrop you a coupon for the two to one sale. They know you bought it in Atlanta. They know who bought that Coke can. They know if you've used the coupon, they're not going to put in the classified newspaper, the inset, like we'll move to the 21st century, right? Universities will do it for their alumni base. Sports teams will do it for their fans. Eventually, in the fullness of time, you'll be in the, you know, local barbecue pit masters club and you'll get the like barbecue master of the month NFT in your wallet, right? So everyone's coming. Over the course of the decade, everyone is going to have many, many NFTs. And I think it's important to note here, the average NFT in your wallet is not going to be a Grail Fidenza or whatever. It's going to be something closer to your Chipotle coupon card. But it doesn't matter. Like These two things mean there will be widespread adoption unless something goes wrong, which we'll talk about in the later section. So thesis one, it's a consumer application. And it's also a way of organizing complex adaptive societies. Um, that's what really got me interested. And in I've been very interested in social tokens and NFTs for community as the new business model. 
and it creates a wholly different dynamic when you have combined network effects between your consumers or your network of of users and yourself or your business. Well, here is this isn't in my mega thesis, but here's here's a framework to thinking about this. I think of NFTs in the in the variation you spoke about as two things. First of all, it's a community interest group where the database is publicly readable and writable. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like what do I mean by that? We don't know or need to know who all the punks holders are, right? But there's some probably some psychodemographics that apply to them. And those are different psychodemographics than apply to board ape holders, which is different than Azuki holders, right? And that's no different than the world at large, right? Like if you're in the database of the Catholic Church, you're statistically, not an individual basis, but an aggregate different than someone that's in the database of the Lutheran Church. Not an individual might be not that, but in aggregate you are. The difference is the punks database is publicly composable. You can not be a punk holder, you cannot be well, Yuga Labs now, and you can still write an application that airdrops something to a punk or composes a punk or allows you to interact with that community. So first kind of version of this is it's turning community groups and membership interest groups inside out. They're sitting there in public as opposed to being hidden. And anytime something goes in public and is composable, it becomes a much bigger deal. The other part though, that comes from the non-fungibility is you can represent much more complex social structures with NFTs than you can with fungible tokens. Correct. All right. Like, Non-fungible tokens, arguably, are a superset of functional tokens, not a subset, right? Because if I made every single NFT the same, it's a fungible token, mm -hmm. right? It, I think of Doge as an open edition, one piece of art, NFT, right? Right. The only, okay. right? But with NFTs, you can actually represent them. I have dozens of real life ideas that uh, I was saying ran organizations, run organizations. Well, because you can get granular, you can represent granular roles in a way you can't with Bitcoin. Absolutely. Right? So I agree completely with this. Let me just stop you one sec because yeah. you brought up yeah, something sure. really interesting. And I had not thought about this before, but I see it because of my bloody wallet, and you will see it is what we've essentially also got, amongst other things, is an open email address book. Yes. So if you think of what we talked about was, um, you know, the kind of how do you contact your customers? Right now, most of us do it via, via email, or if not, you might do it via pop-ups on a mobile site. But what we've done is made every single email database public in NFT world, in the future world, which creates a bit of a problem. Um, of the excessive amounts of information that get thrown at you via your wallet. Because anybody can drop anything to any like-minded person. And this is going to be a marketer's dream for a period of time. And it's going to be a nightmare for the rest of us. I don't know. Have you thought, thought about any of that? I think it is simply um, email before effective anti-spam. I think it is going to be first a marketer's dream, then... Uh, I'm at the leading edge of this because the amount of scammy airdrops that get pushed <laughs> to my wallet so that people think that I'm minting, you know, the slithering snake collection <laughs> is extraordinary. Like the activity feed, it's every every couple of minutes all day long, right? Someone's throwing an NFT mode. This thing is a temporary problem because in the exact same way as we were able to build and effectively solve spam. This is just a form of spam and eventually systems will be built and because they can be built in public, can will iterate pretty quickly to be like, this is a scammy collection. I'm just going to hide it from you in your interface. Like the token will be in your wallet, but you're just never gonna see it, right? Like, And then people or collections that are serious or from trusted providers or that you've clicked in your address book that like, you know, Azuki airdropped to something today. Certainly that one I want to see. 
Mm. Right? Some random thing, maybe I'd let someone spam score it, right? And it can be community based, ultimately, spam scoring. And, like if, and you can see all the metrics, right? If people use them and trade them and whatever, it's, oh, that's a pretty good collection. Uh, let me surface it. Maybe you've actually gotten a nice NFT here. Right? Yeah, because, so, you know, if, if, you know, you've got verified stuff, let's assume in that world, but let's assume, you know, you're a punks holder and Aku airdrop something. There's, you need a verification that you haven't verified, but but whether it's a large group, because it's distributed, we can pretty much solve that quite quickly by allowing the community to decide what is a verifiable thing and what isn't. And then so Correct. maybe that works. Yeah, I think it's an immaturity of the tools, and it's fine because, I mean, all this behavior is emergent. No one thought that this was not an issue for anyone a year and a half, right? <laughs> no. And so, like, now it's then people figured it out. And so I'm not so worried about that. I mean, you say it's like an open email address, but email is fairly open, right? That's why you see it. Sp- that's why you get spam. Yeah. But then we've solved it with filters. So two more big picture theses. One that is not like conceptually important, but it is, I think, important when we talk about NFTs more specifically. I'm pretty sure NFTs are going to flip in fine art distribution. And One of the stories I told on Twitter, so I lived in Soho in Manhattan for 20 years, and it was always like an early in my life, life dream to own an Andy Warhol tomato soup kit. And so when I was 22 in Manhattan and certainly did not have the money to pay that much for a print, I'd go to the museum and I'd take dates to the museum and we'd go look at it. Someday one of these will be mine, right? And then, you know, I get older and then at some point I'm like, hmm. I think I have enough money to be able to do this. And I lived a block away from some of the top Warhol dealers on the planet. The process is hilariously bad, right? You go to them and say, hey, do you have an Andy Warhol tomato soup can? No. Okay. Do you know when you'll have one? Also no. Will you call me when you have one? Maybe. And they say yes. But the guy there at the front desk is writing your name in a post-it. And I'm like, oh, God, he's never going to call me. That post-it's going to be in the trash by tonight, right? And so this goes on for years. I'd pop in every couple months. You know, no, do you want a black bean soup? We have a black bean soup. I'm like, I don't want a black bean soup. I want a tomato soup. It's like a life dream that I have one of these things. <laughs> so this goes on for five years, right? And I think during that period, there might have been one or two that I just missed. Of course, the forgot to call me, or they called some guy they wanted to sell it to more, I don't know, until finally I see one in the window. And I said, oh, okay, I want to buy this one. And then how much is it? Like, it was, I don't know, $140,000, okay. How, why is it this price? Because basically, because we say so. Okay, fine. You know, here's me like fairly, you know, naive art. How do I know it's an Andy Warhol? Well, here's his signature. I'm in crypto for years at this point. That doesn't mean anything. That's security theory. How do I know that's his signature? Well, we are going to give you this certificate that says we say it's a signature. I'm like, you're printing it out right in front of me. It doesn't mean anything either. This was signed in the 1960s. You're printing out the certificate right in front of me today. Yeah, and witnessed by who? Yeah, you know, witnessed by me, who also. And how, how do you know it's a signature? Well, we bought it from this guy in Europe, and he had it in his closet for a very long time. As you can see, it's really good quality. And I mean, a whole bunch of things that were interesting, but not actually why we know that it's Andy Warhol's signature. But you know, this is how it is. That's how I bought it, and I'm pretty sure I have a certain one of those tomato soup cans, as sure as anyone else who buys from the gallery. But I wouldn't say like, I'd bet my life on it, right? <laughs> and so, like, okay, an interesting process. And then I compare it to when I got a second time around at the punk store, and I said, oh, I'm gonna buy a punk. And then another punk, and another punk, and I can't stop. But there, did I have to go to West Broadway in Soho? No. I was, in fact, several thousand miles away from there. In fact, I was locked down in COVID. In fact, I couldn't leave my sofa. 
But all that I need, a Neuro connection and MetaMask. And how do I know it was the right price? Well, I had the global order book since inception in front of me, right? Every sale, every bid, every ask, every transfer. I can bid anyone I want, even if it's not for sale. I can see who has them. You have full transparency. And you're like, oh, I see. This is our distribution's internet moment. It's going from being a pre-internet business to a post-internet business. And some here's someone in the world saying, no, no, but we have websites where we sell art. That's different, right? This is now natively internet, right? The whole thing is, it's not, you have an order management system and then a different unit ships this out to you, right? I've done that too. I've shipped art across continents. It takes months. It's painful. It costs a surprising amount of money, right? And, you know, eBay did not turn out to be some type of subset of Pennsylvania antique shops. It turned out to be a gigantic superset of Pennsylvania antique shops. It was like the global marketplace for non-standard goods or something, right? And that's what's going to happen here. It's not that, I am not saying fine art galleries are gonna go away. I mean, there's antique shops in Pennsylvania today. There's radio stations today, right? But the market opportunity for selling art and then a bunch of other things which we'll talk about in a second online is vastly larger than selling it through a subscale retail shop that on average on a Tuesday afternoon at 11 o'clock has zero people in it, zero, none. That is actually typically what it looks like, right? And so, you know, it's, it's better for artists. You know, Damien Hurst did this drop last year. Damien Hurst, of course, a very famous artist. Damien Hurst can sell his art whenever he wants. But he sold 10,000 pieces in like five minutes. And even if he had like five galleries working for him at the same time, they couldn't sell at that volume at that pace in the real world, even if you're Damien Hurst. I, I, I own one of those as well. Yeah, so do I. And it's like, if, if it was, if you had to go to, I don't know, London or Geneva or Miami or New York to buy one, would you have gotten out of bed to buy one? I don't think I would have. No, and look, I've tried to buy Damien Hurst in the past because that was a cultural reference for me. It was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> and, you know, That's what I'm telling you. you know, it's just as simple as that. It's just a nightmare. You don't know the price. The gallery's ripping you off. Everybody's ripping you off. You don't really know what you're getting. And, you know, I just didn't bother in the end. I bought signed rock and roll music photographs, Mick Rock stuff, because it was easier to get validated because I could buy it from Mick Rock himself. But other than that, I, I gave up. Excellent. Yeah, I agree. This is this is how it is. But the other end of the spectrum is societally more interesting because Damien Hurst is going to be fine in both cases, right? But imagine you're like the top butterfly photographer of Knoxville, Tennessee. Realistically, in a uh, physical retail system, you can't make a living. It has to be your hobby, right? You have to have some type of other job. How many people in Knoxville are going to buy photographs of butterflies in repeating quantities, not enough. You're going to do your own website to try and sell them, try and get into one of our uh, big art. Uh, difficult. Here, though, and I'm not saying it's easy, but you can, Chris Dixon style, find your 50 or 100 true fans that there are probably 100 people in the world who would buy one or two butterfly NFTs a year from your style, and you can turn your hobby into your actual profession. This is going to be an absolute boom for everyone who works in the creative professions, right? This is going to be, you know, the idea of, oh, the creative professions are not well paid is I think largely just because we don't have good technology to transport intangibles. Yeah, they don't scale. Right? They just don't scale generally unless you have unless you're Damien Hurst and you have a marketing engine. But the, and I was going to come on to this later, but I think it's a at point is how the discoverability is still a problem, right? I go onto OpenSea, I'm overwhelmed. And then I go to Nifty Gateway, it's even worse. And then I go into Rarible. You know, it just becomes overwhelming. Huge so problem. We're missing that layer, I, I guess, the Amazon. Uh, and I hate to use that something like that, but, you know, the Amazon experience where it will find you and you find it. 
we will see vastly different cuts at this. Some of that will be that. Some of that will be much better. Some of them will be skeuomorphic, real life style visualizations. I throw that again in the bucket of time, money, uh, economic incentives, and the fact that it's extremely valuable to do discoverability well is yes. going to solve this problem. Yeah, I agree. Right? Like, I agree. And so it doesn't mean automatically because usually on NFT you're going to make money and it does not mean that at all. But you, you have access as a small artist to the same distribution rails as Damien Hurst has on a first class basis. And also what's really fascinating to me is not only do we do it because we, we can think in US terms, but we do it at a global scale. We've got a global clearing price for art. So you can be a young up and coming artist in Niger. It's game changing because you sell on a global basis at a global price, which you don't have an ability to do right now. It is one of the best things about this. You, there is a huge community of Indian photographers in the NFT world, right? Like, and I bought some pieces from them and I've had this exact thought. What is the chance I would have bought from one of these photographers before? The chance is not one in a zillion. How would I find them? Right? And what ship it to me and what have you? Here you have the you know, it's interesting. You asked about discoverability. I, I don't actually discover anything in OpenSea. My discoverability engine is Twitter. Yeah. Probably the best place to see NFTs today is Twitter. Yeah, I see honest. you asking yeah. and people come back to you and give you stuff. So it's always, I love well, no, Twitter but, for that. Right? Like you just, and things come into my feed. My feed's large, obviously. But like, and they're like, oh, that's interesting. And then you go on OpenSea and look at them. Right? So <clears throat> I think it is like all democratizing technologies, right? good for people who have less access previously, right? And then, you know, they'll be like, oh, well, it's not fair. They sell their NFTs cheaper. Like, I mean, how can you really say that? I mean, it's, it's, you're going to say people shouldn't have access to the same payment rails as the rest of the world? In some parts of the world, why shouldn't they have access, right? Why, why shouldn't they have that access? So I think it's going to be, and when I say it's going to flip in it, it's going to take time. I mean, you know, Fine art galleries with physical works will be here in 50 years, right? Like it's, none of that's, nothing's going away, but there'll be vastly more growth and potential in this area. But I think, and here's where we get to the meat of it. Obviously, the most important thing about NFTs is not that we can put art on them, right? NFTs are going to go, in my view, like this. Um, today, we're doing art and collectibles, but also some other things like the Board Ape Yacht Club for me, doesn't slot into art or collectibles cleanly. It's also like some weird decentralized lifestyle franchise. Media. Yeah. Something like that, right? Great. It's, I keep thinking of like, it's like a franchise email, right? Like it's the, except you're, don't go through, you don't have to go to McDonald's University in Illinois and like spend six months getting approved to have a McDonald's franchise. If you want to do something cool with a certain ape and what have you, you just buy it. And then you have the license to commercially exploit it. And here is one where there's still a gigantic failure of imagination. People are like, oh, well, sure, some things have happened, right? Like someone made a <clears throat> microbrew with their board ape and someone made a band and someone made a coffee brand. And none of these things are big yet. But this is just a complete failure of imagination because obviously whether it happens with a board ape or any other project of this type, obviously a model where you are not rate limited by the number of people you hire in your startup, but you're rate limited by the world global community is one of them is going to commercialize vastly better than I need to hire a marketing person and a business development person. How do you scale global? You can't do that. So it's just because these projects are early and three to five years, we will see global brands that were built off NFT collections, you know, probably first in the PFP space. And the basis of acceptable solutions there now, not acceptable solutions, people can do whatever they want, but the basis of solutions that are going to work is either commercial rights to token holders or public domain CC0 in PFP collections. 
from the moment that Yuga bought the Punks IP and took the Punks to the Board Ape commercial model, because they're the last important holdouts, it's over. It is impossible that you can say, I want to make a competitive PFP collection and you, the holder, can't do anything with it, right? Like, that's that's done now. So the question is just, and it's a very interesting question, which will do better? People who are economic motivated for their, they have their own rights themselves or go all the way to the nouns, the, oh, I won't say the word, the MFers, um, and so on, where anyone can do anything. So that's the basis of competition. So the board apes are in that type of, Web 3-ish type business, sort of. We don't know what to call it yet. I don't think we've seen the even a fraction of the models we'll see, but there'll be a class of things that are like that. The other part of this that's happening quickly is music. I know it's part of the creative arts, yeah. but music feels like that is a big area that needs solving, and NFTs work perfectly for large parts of it. It's much less developed than the visual arts, but... Arguably, so let me take even a step back. The visual arts have been on the, their back foot for decades relative to music, right? The visual arts haven't been culturally as important as music for decades now, right? The, the, think about how much day-to-day -day impact and, you know, throw a dart at some, some random person in the world, how much impact has contemporary art had on them versus music, right? It's not really been that close last like it's Whereas some of the prior visual arts movements did, I think, have a bigger impact. NFTs in their first stage have brought the visual arts roaring back, right? Like NFTs today are still primarily visual arts. It's primarily a visual field. But there's all types of super interesting things that can happen in music as well. And I think interesting hybridizations, right, between on-chain and off-chain in music. And it's the whole coming back to making a direct connection with your collectors, fans, community, that it's hard to do it in a nice way through a database. It's just not the same, right? There's not that same. Being a database entry in someone who's sending me an email just does not feel the same as owning a PFP from that person's clutch. Like the aesthetic experience is completely different, right? The psychological experience is completely different. You feel much better in the second than the first, right? So, but where do we go from here? We're going to go to gaming. We're probably two to three years away from like the next generation of games. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, you know, what's not going to work is that every PFP collection of 10,000 NFTs makes their own like half-baked game for those 10,000 NFT audience. None of that's going to work. No, you right? need interoperability and, you know, people who are good at gaming and, to build gaming out. Correct. It's going to take a couple of years because building good games is like making a movie. It mm -hmm. takes a big budget. It takes a couple of years. It needs a talented team. It's orders of magnitude more complex than putting out a PFP project. So a lot of people are going to get disappointed slash rugged with gaming roadmaps in the short term. But eventually the idea that you can and should own your in-game assets and that the take rate of the gaming company should drop from 100% to 3% feels inevitable, right? And that's coming. I would say from there, you look at all of societal intangibles. And here, I'm going to have to scratch the surface of it. I think this is transportation tech for societal intangibles. It's like when we people figured out how to create whole classes of financial instruments. And the fact that you can hold and own and transport and compose intangibles means they will become more valuable. I've, right. I've been <laughs> talking a lot about this, and a lot of people don't really understand what I'm trying to say, but there's $63 trillion of intangibles on the global balance sheets of corporations. That's just corporations, not the intangibles that we all have. $63 trillion. This turns tangibles, intangibles into tangibles. That is where 
the enormous multiplier effect on GDP and wealth comes from? The, we are on exactly the same page. Those are the ones that are countable, the intentions. Correct. Right? There's so many more we don't even know yet. Well, I mean, the United States of America, the Statue of Liberty, <laughs> yeah. the U.S. flag, the land of the free and the home of the brave, the American dream, these are all intangibles. Those intangibles are worth, my guess is, individual. Uh, those that that complex of intangibles are worth trillions of dollars in the United States. I've generally right? found the, that the intangibles, once you tokenize them, just theoretically speaking and observationally speaking, are worth more than the actual equity of most things. Yep. Correct. I think that's right. I, 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 yeah. it, we are taking, you know, the story of you know, financial markets is taking things that were not tradable and making them tradable, right? Like, and this has been that way for centuries, right? More and more assets you can make markets in, right? And people are going to hear this and say, oh my God, this is terrible. It's the financialization of the world. The one thing we had left, I, I disagree completely, you know, the starving artist is a bug, not a feature, right? Intangible, intangible cultural providers in a world where all the basic stuff is going to get automated should be highly paid. Culture is the most valuable thing we have. And I want to get into this conversation about memes and all of this because culture is it. That is what it is to be human. And as you said, we can allow the robots to take our jobs. But culture is all we have as humans. So it's valuable. Look, I'm, I'm well known for saying this, right? Like, I use memes in my own interpretation, but they're like, I think it's the casual way to say the Harari intersubjective myths, right? The intersubjective myths that these are the, and what are intersubjective things? Things that don't really exist, but we all pretend they exist to organize large groups of people. Yeah. The United States, human rights, uh, General Motors, none of these things exist. You can't find General Motors. It's an idea. It's a framework, right? But the idea of General Motors existing allows you to organize a lot of people in a coherent manner. It's how you go from societies of 150 people to millions of people. Correct. They are the most important things in the world. Everything is downstream from them, right? Like Obama was a master meme maker. Donald Trump was a master meme maker, right? Yes, we can and make America great again, each of those two things give you access to enough nuclear weapons to destroy the planet, right? It's just some simple words, some simple imagery, repeated many times, and you become the most powerful person on the planet, right? Just do it. Three little words, a very simple swoosh. How many tens of billions a year of additional revenue is that worth, right? I see these I see these estimates of you know how much the Nike IP is worth and it's like tens of billions of dollars. That's wrong. No, it's, it's tens of it's way wrong. Nike, it's that much per year. Correct. Right? Because otherwise, if Nike shoes were unbranded, they wouldn't sell for one fifth the price. Right. So this is the basis of human society. This is how human society is architected. And now, because I mean, that is, that is sorry, that's religion, that's government, that's everything. everything. Everything is a narrative that we tell ourselves in order to accept a, a societal organization, as you say. We are designed to think in narratives, right? Yeah. We are the, the human brain thinks in narratives, and it's how society organizes itself. And what has happened now is those narratives are leaving the hands of centralized parties, right? And are now accessible on an individual basis, right? They're, they're being communityized. It is the exact same model that you had a bank account in 2013 and then I say, oh, Bitcoin, right. It's a bank account without the bank. It's the same thing, but for narratives, for myths, for memes, so I keep saying, seize the memes of production. And what right? do you like, mean? What do you mean by that? Because I don't think, I, me included, really understand what you mean. I mean what I just said a second ago. If we, I, I gave two examples of people who became president, right? And they operated in a party system, right? Like if you were, if you were just as eloquent as Obama, but ran as an independent, you probably couldn't become president, right? 
if you had a nice logo, but you weren't Nike, probably can't make a competitive, can't make a competitive company to them, right? Here, you can actually directly own the intangibles on a first class basis with anyone else, right? If we agree that, and agree is just a social construction, right? If, if we start moving around intangibles on tokens in a permissionless system that everyone can access, that everyone can use the same rails that Nike doesn't have a distribution advantage. They might have a marketing advantage, but it's different, right? The marketing advantage and the distribution advantage are different. Damien Hurst might have a marketing advantage to the butterfly photographer in Knoxville, but Damien Hurst does not have a distribution advantage. Previously, he had a distribution advantage. He was in the gallery in the big cities, and the butterfly photographer is not. Now, they're on the same rails, ERC tokens with a variety of marketplaces and discoverability and blah, blah, blah. They have a marketing advantage, which is fine. Like, there's always going to be marketing advantages. So now any person on the planet has access to the same meme transportation technology as the most powerful person on the planet. And generally, the medium is the message, right? Things change when mediums change. There's a land grab of sorts, right? Because the medium is the message. The message changes with the medium. So the message is changing because the medium has changed dramatically. And so there's a period that's not an infinite period where you can set new cultural and societal standards, right? That period is now. In 10 years, it's going to solidify. It's going to ossify. And then, you know, 20 years from now, there'll be something else, right? There's that process always of renewal. But a society with television is different than a society without television. A society with the internet is different than a society without the internet. It's not the same pre-internet society, but with Google and Facebook and Twitter, right? The society itself changes when you have Twitter. Everything about how humans interact changes when you have Facebook and Match and Tinder and Uber and Airbnb. It becomes a different society. And here, society will change because we now have direct first-class access to mimetic rails. It's a huge deal. It's an endlessly big deal. Even I, I feel I see just the faintest outlines of what it's going to be. But what I think it's going to be is actually gigantic, right? And I think there's an opportunity today in this field for people with all types of different skills, including for people with skills which historically might have not been valued in the technology industry, right? Like, you know, the technology industry has sucked up a huge amount of societal value in the last Hey there, visionaries. Years, Your free membership to Real Vision and Crypto, it has the served, it has premier favored, source for cryptocurrency and digital person, asset right, analysis, is available right Google now at realvision.com slash crypto. not hugely different from the type of person who can found a Twitter, right? Well, here we've made the rails accessible. to everyone. There's, there's a little bit of tech you need to learn, but not that much. And then whatever your skill set is, right, you can actually, whatever your culture, your orientation, the thing you want to get out, you have access to the same rails as everyone else. And it's a very big deal. And so my kind of fourth bucket or what have you here is societal intangibles will start moving around in on rails. And everyone says, okay, this is all, this is all made up. Um, you guys are just playing a game with yourselves. It's just a social construction. Of course, it's just a social construction, but so is the title deed to your house, right? It's a social construction that if a piece of paper is in a certain office and it has your name on it, you then have the right to put a fence on this piece of land and shoot someone who comes on it, right? That that paper is, that paper, the land is just as off chain to that paper as anything else we're doing in NFTs, right? And so the reason that paper means something is a whole agreed system that that paper means something. And what has emerged emergently is that if you own this token from this smart contract, in fact, token 6529, we're all going to agree that you own punk 6529. It's no different than if we say, hey, you have this 
title deed for this house. We're all going to agree and then use the whole enforcement mechanism of society to protect your house. It's equally made up, right? Like you don't think of it, the houses feel very, very tangible, but the fact that the state will enforce your right to live in your house because your name's on the piece of paper is just as much a social convention that this, that I can say I'm six five to nine because this token's in my Ethereum wall, right? And so now we're, we've found a social convention for moving on intentions. Big deal, deeply unexplored yet, okay? We've barely scratched the surface. And then I'm gonna take one more step because this is where it's the part that's most important to me. And that's quote unquote metaverse, right? So that was my next question, the battleground for the open metaverse. Okay, this, this to me also deeply misunderstood. First of all, everyone, uh, not everyone, a lot of people have the wrong idea of what the metaverse is. The metaverse is not going to be like some goofy second life number two where you're walking around with VR glasses and like Minecraft or something. That's fun, it might be great, but that's not the metaverse. The metaverse is just the internet. It's just the internet with two differences. First of all, the visualization layer is going to get better, as it has been for decades. I can see you now, and 10 years ago, this would have been a conference call, right? I wouldn't have been able to see you, but you're still like kind of like two square inches on my screen, and I'm pretty sure you're a full-size man, right? And so in 10 years, you're gonna have a pair of sunglasses on, I'm gonna have a pair of sunglasses on, there'll be heads-up displays, we'll be in augmented reality on a permanent basis, we'll press a button, you'll show up in front of me, I'll show up in front of you, We'll talk about board apes, they'll float in front of us. We'll talk about skeuomorphic discoverability and some type of virtual art gallery will show up in front of us, right? It's going to be this blended digital hybrid space that we're in permanently. It's all your current screen time, but plus all the rest of your waking hours that are not screen time, because those glasses are never leaving your head because they're gonna be super useful and convenient. And arguably, it's better even for like, your friends and family that you don't have a phone stick in your head, you can be looking ahead of you and then if a notification comes, it comes, right? So the one is the visualization. The other part though, goes back to where we started. We now have composable cross-application digital objects. They have left the databases of a bunch of companies, right? We have digital objects now, but my digital objects now, X, Y, NFTs, are in the Twitter database, my tweets. My, on Facebook, uh, there's pictures of me doing things. Oh, look, it's me eating a dumpling. It's in Facebook's database. If I want access to another application, what do I have to do? Get an API key. Make sure I follow the terms of service. Code a custom integration with another application. This is pre-internet type stuff. This is like trying to run the internet with content management, proprietary content management systems. NFTs is we've now invented hyperlinking, we've invented HTML, we've invented a common platform that I can take 6529 and put him in a social network or put him in a gallery or put him in a game or put him in a lending platform or put him in any one of the next thousand applications that are gonna come. And so, this is where all the innovation will happen, right? Like all the innovation is going to happen because you don't, you have permissionless innovation, just like you have programmable permissionless money with Bitcoin, right? You now have permissionless innovation on cultural digital objects. So you put those two things together, the metaverse is going to be epically compelling, right? Because now this is the part where people say like, oh no, I'm not going to wear those glasses, right? Just like you're not going to get a smartphone, right? Just like you're not going to like, Use Google and Twitter and Facebook and email and, and oh, I'm not going to use Facebook. Yeah, 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 come on, right? Like all this stuff is hugely convenient. It makes you more productive. It fires your dopamine receptors. You're always going to do it, right? So since we're inevitably going to live in this space, it then the most important societal discussion that we are not having is since this world is coming, how should it be architected, right? And right now, there are only two choices, the ones we said at the beginning of the conversation. It can be those digital objects and your position in those digital objects can be in a database, which realistically means a company's database, because I don't think the government is going to build the metaverse platforms, right? Or it can be in a blockchain. 
There is no third thing we've invented. These are your two choices. And so if you think NFTs are not the way, then I ask you, tell me which company should own this. And my view is no company should own this because it is problematic. And it's problematic in the classic Web 1, Web 2 but, scenario. Like, but surely one company won't own it, right? Just a multitude of experiences of which we can move our digital identity and digital belongings across them. So therefore, you, can, you can move them across if they're NFTs. Yeah, you cannot course. move them across if, well, but that's the whole battle. It doesn't work without NFTs. It's, it's impossible. Well, but that's the whole battle because the whole battle, and I, it is a battle. We have not won this battle, right? Facebook does not want this to run on NFTs. They want it to run in meta servers, right? Unreal, the CEO gave a speech the other day in Asia somewhere. So it's a multi trillion dollar opportunity for my company. He means in his company's database, right? And we have gone astray on internet architecture. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm, internet, not, I'm not sure that these people don't understand the magnitude of what is happening. You know, having spoken to quite a few kind of very senior people at, let's say, Meta, they mm -hmm. get the interoperability. They get it. They're like, we can't stand in the way of this because nobody's going to trust us. I mean, okay. whether it happens is or that not, why, that's a different matter. Is that, is that why you have to log into Facebook to use an Oculus? Well, only now. In the future, I'll just use my NFT, my digital identity. Right, but like, I know they're saying those things, right? And I hope you're right, by the way, right? Nothing, I'm not an enemy of Facebook. I would like nothing. Facebook could be a huge force for decentralization if they supported decentralized digital objects natively on a first-class basis. Yeah, I agree. That, so far, is blah, blah. What is actually a released product is integrated ecosystem. Yeah. Okay? And it's integrated ecosystem from the software platform to the hardware platform. And it's a bet the company integrated ecosystem as of today. When that changes, my view will change. I look at what people ship, not what they tell us, right? And it's, you know, Web1 had the right architecture. <clears throat> Came out of academia, that's why, right? Like they, they didn't think to monetize. So email is SMTP, which means it's an interoperable standard, which means if you like Gmail, you can use Gmail. If you like Outlook, you can use Outlook. If you don't like any of these things, you can run your own email server. Short messaging online turns out to be Twitter. And that has all types of weird outcomes, right? One thing that like was, I think, a wake-up call, is it's always a wake-up call for a lot of governments around the world. It doesn't matter if you like Jack Dorsey or don't like Jack Dorsey. It doesn't matter if you like Donald Trump or don't like Donald Trump. This is completely relevant to what I'm about to say. It is deeply weird that for some strange reason, Jack Dorsey was one of the most important people who had to have an opinion on if there was a coup happening in the United States. Because Jack Dorsey is a talented tech executive, but he's a random CEO of a random tech company. Why on earth would that be his decision? Right? It's like saying, we need to decide on, I don't know, our policy for national defense, and we're going to ask the CEO of Procter & Gamble. Right? Like, we have courts. We have elected representatives. Right? We have police. We have all of these systems of democratic governance, and in no model of democratic governance would you assume that the person who can wipe you off the internet should be the CEO of one or two random tech companies, right? And they were all within their rights. The First Amendment does not apply to private companies, right? The problem isn't that Twitter doesn't want Donald Trump in their servers. It's a perfectly fine decision. They might not want him. That's a business decision. The problem is once you're not on Twitter's servers, you're cut off from global short messaging. Whereas once you're Donald Trump, I don't know if he's been knocked off of people's posted emails, but he, can, he clearly can send emails because worst case scenario, he can have server. And the problem is that, oh, but I don't like Donald Trump, they did the right thing. But the problem is they have to make this decision for 8 billion people on the planet. It is impossible decision, right? The Russian foreign ministry has a Twitter account. Are they more? or less appropriate to have a Twitter account. I have no idea. It's not like they can, it's impossible to make these decisions correctly, right? The answer, I mean, imagine it the other way. Imagine if we said, no, 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 we need to have a CEO of email, and that CEO needs to be a public company CEO with all the obligations and risks and shareholder pressures of a CEO, and that CEO has to decide if every single person on the planet has to email. It's obviously ridiculous. And yet that's what, 
short messaging is, and it's what medium messaging is. Right? Medium messaging is Facebook. And so project out now 10 years, right? This metaverse isn't like Twitter, isn't like Facebook. It's infinity times better. It's photorealistic. It's all around you. It's augmented. It has all these great features. If you can get kicked out of that space, it's like you're going to be cast into the darkness. Mm. Okay? You cannot, you could maybe live with losing your Twitter account. You will not be able to live with losing the metaverse, right? Your productivity is not going to happen. You're not going to be able to work. You're not going to be able to socialize with your Essentially, friends. Essentially, right? it's like being put into prison. Correct. Right? So which, you're it's digital a, prison. It's a state level decision by the jurisdictional structure of society, and it can't be decided upon by a corporation. Right, and by a corporation, I, I keep saying Jack Dorsey, ha ha, but it's not really Jack Dorsey. No. It's a bunch of teams somewhere in some outsourced data center trying to make these decisions, right? I mean, it's wholly inappropriate people to make these decisions, right? Like, what, what context do they have? Do they have legal training? Do they have no, they're just following some checklist. Like, how else can you do it at scale? But there's also something else. I keep saying the end state is augmented reality. I think it is, right? But why does augmented rea- how does augmented reality work? Augmented reality works because you have a camera looking into your field of vision, right? So imagine I don't know, you have a family, you have kids, you're, you have, would you think to yourself, it would make a lot of sense for some tech company to have God's eye view of everything your son or daughter is seeing for the next 20 years? Even if they told you, no, no, don't worry, I'll be encrypted. We definitely won't use it inappropriately, right? Would any of those tech executives say, yeah, you know, 6529, I would be happy if you go place a camera on my family's face. Yeah, my wife, me, my kids, you have a camera. You just, I'm, I'm sure your privacy policies are fine at 6529, and you certainly won't do anything inappropriate with having constant video surveillance of my life, right? That's yeah. what it's going to be. And we remember right. Mark Zuckerberg tapes over his his camera on his laptop, if you remember. Correct. And this is going to be a hundred times more intrusive, right? And then the bigger problem is not Mark. It's not Jack. Any system that generates this much power will be impossible for it not to fumble the power to the state. If you have global God's eye view of everyone on the planet on everything they're doing, the NSA is going to show up to your door, right? And if it's not the NSA, it's someone else. And the state will not be able to tolerate a company being vastly more powerful than the state infrastructure, right? And so the very weird thing, we know that China is building some type of social credit system of this. other. It's like, there's all types of presentations of it. And you read things in the media, not exactly right, but Broadly, it's right. Like, broadly, the idea that, like, oh, look, we weren't too thrilled with what you've been doing recently. Back to the second-class trade, et cetera, et cetera, right? And we say, oh, I can't believe the Chinese are doing that. That's for me. We're building the same system. We're just building it by mistake, right? The And we're building it across all dimensions. We talked about the metaverse of visualization part. But we are progressively centralizing everywhere. Take a simple example. A taxi ride in New York. 25 years ago, if you wanted to block me from taking a taxi ride in New York, effectively, you have to arrest me, okay? How are you going to block me? You hail a taxi, you take some cash out of your pocket, take me to 52nd Street, right? Okay. You have to arrest me to stop it. Right? How would you stop it? Today, we're not all the way there, but mostly there. If you just flip a switch on Uber and Lyft because uh, you don't like me, I can't hail a taxi. Right now, there's still some yellow cabs, but I noticed the other day that like Uber is now going to be also integrating yellow cabs. I mean, the yellow cabs have their own app. Another three to four years, all taxi rides are going to be electronically intermediated by like three or four companies. And then inevitably, someone's going to be socially undesirable and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you violate the terms of service. And, yeah, we don't want that type of person in Uber because, you know, we have liability. What if, what if he punches a taxi driver? What if he punches a Uber driver? We don't like him, right? And then you'll be able, with a flip of a switch, to ban someone from taxes from New York, which sure sounds like the types of things that we say, oh, that's very bad happening in China, right? The other dimension of this, CBDCs. CBDCs are very interesting. 
Should there be national sovereign currencies, true stable coins um, available online? Yeah, I think that's interesting. But what's less interesting, the less interesting part is this. If you look at what the BIS says, what the ECB says, it's a little bit more mixed in the US and the Fed, it's a little bit more mixed. There's voices in both directions. But they say, oh, it's great. You can, we'll be able to, I don't know, effectively end crime because um, we can censor any undesirable transaction. They'll use it as a behavioral yeah. economic system. I've been saying this for ages. And that's both, Obviously. Good. That's both good and terrible. <laughs> and, and it's even worse than that. That, that. that, maybe that's good or bad. What will actually happen is some aspiring totalitarian will get a hold of their central bank's node and his or her political opponent's election time won't be able to buy a tomato. Okay? Because if you think about the top totalitarians of all time, they still couldn't prevent someone many time zones away from their capital from transacting. Right? Hard. It's hard to prevent people from transacting in cash. Right? You have it's a very intensive process to get every transaction under your control. Once you move everyone to a, CB, a centralized permission CBDC, then you just run machine learning algorithms, you run big data algorithms, and you have what I worry about, and it's interesting because I've been worried about this for years, and all my in real life friends randomly are subjected to these rants at like dinners and stuff. And they start with like, it's weird, we're like, setting up i think it's mostly accidental it's partially you know it's partially the u.s surveillance infrastructure financial surveillance infrastructure but also partially accidental we're bit by bit setting up the fall a global sensible digital money system a oligopolistic uh services infrastructure you know cars airbnbs etc etc now the digital space in which we're going to live all the time in 10 years, the metaverse, right? And let's say all of these end up in 10, 15 entities, right? You have set something up that if someday a truly bad person ever managed to grab power, it's the biggest tiny pot in human history. Yeah, I, I totally agree. The issue I've got with all of this is we sold ourselves to the devil 15 years ago. Every single thing that we do, we have given to databases, controlled mm -hmm. by very few people. I mean, mm -hmm. people argue this is, oh, you're taking my privacy. You haven't been able to take 10,000 pounds, or in Europe's case, in some cases, 2,000 euros out of a bank account for a 10 years now and move it around. So everything is now, obviously, anything the government wants to know, they can know. But even bigger than that, that I have a real problem with with this, is I don't know if you've read This Is How They Tell You That The World May End, about cyber hacking, written by the I New York Times. It's, it's an extraordinary no, book, and it's utterly terrifying. Okay. Because it's not about, let's, let's just say that democracy works and power is not seized in Western democracies, that everything just ticks along as it has been in the usual drama that is a democracy. But the fact that this stuff can get hacked is the fact that you can have an entire entire sovereign state seized by a third party and there's pretty much nothing you can do about it. It is yeah. utterly terrifying. Uh, look, look, I think the reality is and every decision on law and order is a is a trade-off between private crime and public crime, right? That's why we have constitutional democracies. If we said the state is always right, and then by definition, you don't need civil rights. The state will always, by definition, make the right decision. If you're a bad person, you should be punished. And what's the need for a due process, right? Like the AML KYC infrastructure, which I'm not, as a matter of principle, opposed to AML KYC, but I am opposed to the way it's been architected, right? Agreed. It, it runs through FATF, right? There's very limited national debate on what the trade-offs are, and there's no due process. Like, look, the, the, you don't have to look far. Like, the fact that, like, most crypto companies can't get a bank account 
<laughs> even though crypto is perfectly legal, is a perfect example of this. Right? Like the democratic thing to do is to pass a law and say it's illegal to be a crypto company. It's illegal to be an adult entertainer. It's illegal to have a marijuana shop, right? And then the people can choose if they agree with what their elected representatives did and want to live in a country where crypto and adult entertainment, they go, fine, it's all right. If they say, no, actually, I don't want that, they can elect different representatives who will change the laws. Here, we have the laws that say X and a shadow system of bureaucrats that nobody has ever discussed, nobody um, elected, nobody has any transparency in what they're doing, who have just made up their own set of rules and are doing their own thing. It's bizarre. And it's it's in very nice terms, risk management and this and that. It doesn't... It kind of avoided your attention that they've seized Russian oligarchs, whatever, by what definition, all of their assets in foreign countries with no due legal process. Look... Slightly terrifying. Uh, to me, the, the funniest one of all, I mean, not funny, but funny, was the Canadian thing, yeah. right? Because... I've been, so I said, I've been harassing people about this stuff for a long time, and mostly people think I'm nuts. And, you know, I'm generally otherwise a pleasant and, I think, mild-mannered person. And they're like, oh, oh there he goes again. And I'd always like, look, what if some aspiring dictator does that? And I'm like, uh-huh, uh -huh. Justin Trudeau? Really? Justin Trudeau? Like, Justin Trudeau hauled out the full, like, terrorism national emergency we're going to freeze everyone's accounts and starve them out of the square infrastructure for these things. I am not saying these things aren't annoying. I'm sure they're annoying. I'm not even saying that I suspect I don't have very much in common with the guys that were causing all these issues, right? I suspect if I lived there, I'd find them immensely annoying. But the reality is, if you set the precedent that for something that I'm pretty sure was not the type of national emergency that Canada was going to fall, right? I don't think they were going to... Canada has a pretty serious army, right? Canada was not about to fall. If that means you can, without due process, freeze the money of anyone who's even sent them money for a sandwich, that is the model of which the next attack is going to happen, right? That's a small trial run over the most implausible place of all, right? I don't think... And I don't even think, like, Justin is planning something crazy. I think he got caught in a tough spot and it was politically expedient to solve it this way instead of like, you know, sending police and having fights in the street and people getting hurt and then being... But the reason he could do it is because the infrastructure is mostly centralized, hmm. right? Today, it's mostly centralized and we're heading for it to be 100% centralized. And once it's there, the temptation to use it is high, right? When even a Justin Trudeau uses this, well, I mean, come on. He's no future totalitarian dictator, right? He's like fairly normal politician, but he was in a tight spot. The infrastructure was there. He used it. Someone else will use it. The lines will erode. And there is, you know, was a mo probably I think the most popular tweet storm, like you don't actually have any constitutional rights in practice if someone can just freeze your money, right? How do you... Oh, I want to exercise my right to free speech. Great. I want to go to D.C. in March. Oh, but I don't have any money. Right? Like, I can't spend money. I am socially undesirable. Oh, I want to buy a gun. Oh, right. Money again. Oh, I want to exercise my religion. Oh, right. There's a priest and a church. Yeah, it's, and, it's, it's, a cheaper way, it's a cheaper way than putting, uh, of putting people in prison, you know, because basically you're robbed of all your rights because you can't do anything. Correct. It is a cheap way of, like, depriving them of all their constitutional rights indirectly. So... I get it. You know, I, fit, I I worry some stuff. Some parts of democracy, I kind of think, okay, we, we've got to draw these battlegrounds anyway. I think democracy itself in this fourth turning moment needs to get redefined in, in some way that better represents democracy and not an oligopoly um, or a corporate, corporatist world. But, okay, so how... We've talked about this battle for the metaverse, which is essentially all of this battle. There's two things I want to get from you is, okay, how do we solve that with blockchain with what we're doing? What is required for that to be true? And also the other thing we didn't, 
we've kind of skirted around and haven't talked about is digital identity to make this all unlock. So a couple of things mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, let's start with the first one. And I think, you know, I can give this hyper complicated answer. Hyper complicated answers never are not viable for anything practical. I think the way we end up in an open metaverse is to get 100 million people using NFTs. Yeah. Uh, the reason for that is we have to leverage and that's the NFTs fact as opposed to fungible tokens. Is correct. Or, okay. Correct. NFTs, and I'll tell you why I think that how it's going to play out. We said earlier, and I think it sounds sensible that like Dolce Gabbana and Nike and everyone else and you know Ohio State University are going to issue NFTs. It's an obvious money maker for them, right? So they have a very simple. They can take their Dolce Gabbana has valuable intangibles. The Ohio State Buckeyes have valuable intangibles, right? And so now they can directly monetize. So they will. If there's a hundred million people using NFTs, they will issue NFTs. And if everyone issues NFTs, then the network effects take over. And seven years from now, there's a billion people using NFTs and it's there's no There's no right? attack vector, in other words. If instead, if instead, a year from now, there's 2 million people using NFTs and some Web2 company, maybe Facebook, launches a NFTs-like product that looks like NFTs. Oh, you own this piece of art, this generative art, or this punk, but it's in a database. And they say, yeah, Ohio State, you can mint to this database. Here's our software development kit, our API, whatever, right? And that gets the lead. Well, I mean, Ohio State University is going to do what Ohio State's university imperative is, right? They have students and alums. And if their students and alums want their virtual Buckeye hat on the Facebook platform and not as an ERC721 token, Ohio State University is going to do that. And because we are maybe one or two years away from a tidal wave of institutions pushing for these things, right, and pushing their own communities towards these things. The path dependence of if 10 years from now, are your digital objects behind some company's database or are they on open standard, that path dependence is going to get set in the next six to 18 months. The whole game is going to be done now. And do you not think that, I mean, I, yes, I agree. And I agree that NFTs are very important because that is culture and you know the, some of the really important things that is that is what brings in the masses but, but can cryptocurrencies themselves because it's been interesting as people go down the learning journey once they buy something they kind of learn a bit more about it and then understand this world of decentralization and the ability to own your own assets wherever you are however you are do you not think that applies as well that it depends what scales i guess right I'm a little disappointed in that, to be honest. Yeah. And my disappointment has to do with a couple of factors. What we have, and it's interesting to tease out why it may be different, it may not be different, why it may be different than NFTs, right? Cryptocurrency has been adopted much more than, faster than I expected. But it's all in centralized platforms, right? They say like, oh, 30 million people own cryptocurrency. And how many people own that in their own wallet? Yeah tiny numbers, right? The types of people who anyway were open to this message, right? It's not, we have not had any mass adoption of any decentralization message through fungible tokens. We have had a very interesting financial game, right? A very interesting technological uh, set of breakthroughs, but we certainly haven't built any robust decentralized infrastructure from it, in my opinion. Right. And, you know, it's been eight years. Well, it's been more than eight years, so 2009. But, like, if you think, like, like first, that first burst into mainstream media was in 2013, right? It's been eight years. Well, or nine years. Uh, it'll be nine years soon. Well, I don't know. Is it just dying to happen and it's not going to happen? I don't think so. I don't, still, most of my friends don't own crypto. But my friends that own crypto all own it on an exchange, I think. Maybe some in a custodian, but mostly on an exchange. I, I'm kind of, Ed, you know, the person I I defer to in this is the person I kind of trust in this space. 
I, I, don't, I don't know if you know Ian Rogers. I'm sure you've come across him. Yeah, uh, of course. And, you know, I think what that's what he's trying to build is the ability for us to be able to move around with our own wallet outside of the cold storage of Ledger, but a world where we don't leave it on an exchange because it's so easy to put it into a better environment. I don't know. What are your thoughts? And I kind of, I know he's working on that and, you know, he's one of the world's best UX people. I kind of figure I don't know. we'll get it solved. I don't know. I, uh, I have a different view on it. The right. reason NFTs might end up not in custodians is because they're, there's more things you do with them, right? The default thing you do with Bitcoin right. is yeah, nothing. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. You've got your own wallet because you're using them all the time. Correct. And it's that, that's that was one of, like, my big, I think my most important contribution to the NFT space, why I booted up 6529, was like, oh, these might work for decentralization, which is going to be very important in the next decade, in a way that practically across hundreds of millions of people in a way that tokens, fungible tokens have. And I mean, it's clear that they have it, right? Like, well, what's the counter evidence that they have? And it's a UX problem, but it's a UX problem more broadly defined. It's fun to play with your NFTs. Yeah, yeah. It's fun to go mint take your, I don't know, cool cat and mint a baby cool cat or whatever you're doing, or like put, take your NFT and put it in an on cyber gallery. It's fun. Like, yeah, I'm an adult professional and I'm having fun with it. But it's still fucking terrifying. It's terrifying to move everything around. And, you know, oh, I've been, you know, I, 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 you know, I've, I've had a, you know, I've been involved in this space since 2013 and I'm still terrified of moving stuff around. And are you clicking on the wrong link? Have you got the right address? It's it's utterly terrifying. That that needs to get solved, but I think it will get solved. I think um, a, a, a wallet experience that allows us not to leave things on exchanges, because for the reasons you say, I think I think you're right, actually. I think NFT is the spearhead from which I also think social tokens, because these are things you're going to use all day, every day. Right, because, the, by the way, I mean, you remember this in 2013, we were going to use Bitcoin all day, every day as well. But it the, the people that, the like just stash it in the ground people one that's i mean okay fine the price has gone up but people don't use bitcoin like the whole bitcoin community is like oh people are trying to scam you out of your bitcoins like don't, don't use them well okay yeah, that's you go tell name. a normal you go tell a normal person don't use this but also go through this super complicated infrastructure to like keep it safe we're gonna leave it i mean i'm quite technically experienced i once at some point had to move the 6529 museum nfts from a treasure to a gnosis multi-sig at the point i'm like oh this is not i need to step up my security and i had to move like a thousand nfts or something oh. including some of the most like iconic nfts in the world and i spent the whole time terrified that i was going to fumble some type of cultural grail <laughs> and then i was going to have to go on twitter the next day and shame and be like I know, like, I'm supposedly sophisticated, but I blew it. Can somebody send me my NFT back, please? <laughs> my NFT, well, it's gone forever. I've, like, sent summer.jpg into the ether. It will never be seen again. Sorry, guys. And literally, when I spent, like, it took me, like, a week the whole time. That was the whole, I'm like, oh, God. I'm just going to screw up epically, right? So the UX sucks. I have spent quite a bit of time behind the scenes, constructively sharing suggestions, let's say, with all the big infrastructure providers of the space. Because, and I get, I, mean, I have some sympathy for them because the space is like 100x in the last year and a half. And so they're like scrambling around just to make sure the lights stay on. But they need to hire every UX person on the planet. And there needs to be a shift like there was with the auto industry when the auto industry shifted gears from saying accidents are user error to accidents and deaths are our fault. Okay. Every time I see, and this is like every week, someone has accidentally sent their board ape to some scam contract. My takeaway is different than the majority of Twitter is like, oh, there you go, the board ape idiots again. 
handing over their valuable NFTs, right? No, that should be treated like a Six Sigma quality failure for the industry. Yes. It's obviously knowable by software, which contracts are real board apes contracts, right? Like it's trivially known. You should flag it at the software level, right? There should be 27 warnings where they're like, don't do this. Like the last three people who did this were underneath their bed in a puddle of tears afterwards. Are you still sure you want to do this? I mean, that's how it should be. And because if we don't get this right, we will end up on centralized systems because it's not societally acceptable or reasonable that someone makes a fairly innocent mistake in the scheme of things and loses a million dollars, right? Like, it can't be that way. Like, no. So the UX has to get much, much better. The industry has to work together. They should set common standards. They should use the same graphics. They should think about, I mean, things that happen. And I'm not blaming anyone because it's just, it's a super challenge, but like MetaMask and Trezor and OpenSea at some point did upgrades at a different time and broke the whole infrastructure between themselves. No one was doing anything wrong, but these things have to interoperate. So there needs to be a significant upgrading and investment of time, energy, UX on safety and usability because it's not ready for mass market yet, right? Like, mass market's coming and it's not ready for mass market. And so we're just going to have people blowing themselves up and it's a shame and it's sad. And like a world where the scammers win is not like any type of societal victory, right? Like that's a failure state. And of course, people should spend time in education, right? Like they, they, there is, if I told you I'm giving you keys to my car and no, you don't have to take driving lessons and you don't have to read the driver's manual and you don't have to pass a driving test. Well, you crash the car, right? I mean, so there needs to be some awareness by people of like, you should learn the basics, but it's primarily an industry problem to solve, I think. Now, we have another risk factor though, that it's the most frustrating of all, is that government is working against us, not with us, right? Theoretically, and it's funny, like all the, I think about this primarily in the US and Europe, because quite frankly, you know, China's not going to be on our side on this. I don't think Russia is going to be on our side on this, right? So really, it's like the people who might think it's important that we have constitutional rights on transactions are going to be the major economies. Okay, well, where does everyone stand? The European Union? They lost Web 2 epically to the Americans, right? There's, they are digital vassals to the Americans. They have all these conferences on how do we recover our national sovereignty and social networking and, and search. And they come up with these ideas that, of course, are never going to work. Like France is going to make its own search engine. None of that stuff's going to work, right? And sitting right in front of them for the last decade is the answer. Because the most powerful thing the EU could do to reduce the power of the American tech oligopolies is Web3. Yeah, because it, it beats them oligopolies. Of course. And they have another advantage that they don't have the Howey test. So you don't have this thing that like, the second you do something useful for your users, you're violating securities laws. <laughs> right? Like, if you give nothing to your users, it's, a, it's okay. Like, if you give them their fees back, oh, you're violating their rights somehow. Anyway, I mean, this is what it is. Europe doesn't have this. So Europe has this wide open opportunity to catch up and they're in the process of fumbling. I don't know if you saw the news today. It moved out of committee. The the like they are one step away from banning wallets, right? They're one step away from saying, yes, the future of crypto in Europe is you're gonna hold your crypto in a subsidiary of Deutsche Bank and Societe General. Yeah, that's how Web3 is going to happen. Right? So EU's fumbling. The US Okay, definitely has much more infrastructure and a much more developed sector. But there has yet to be a party to just grab this by the horns and run with this. Like, Trump was pretty deeply anti-crypto. There's suspicion of crypto on the Democratic side, even though arguably for the same reasons as the EU, it's favorable to them, right? Like, it breaks up big corporations, right? Like, 
but there's suspicion. And so there hasn't been an advocate in, a true advocate for, you know, if we had taken the same attitude in the mid-90s with the internet, the U.S. internet would have not become the powerhouse it became, right? The U.S. internet was given some structural benefits, you know, you don't have to collect sales taxes, or we're going to treat e-signatures as real, or Section 230, is like, get it said, it needs these to develop, and it turned out to be the greatest productivity machine of the last 50 years. And here, not only we're not getting these types of supportive measures, the whole crypto industry is trying to fight to just keep from going backwards. And you know, that that thing that passed the infrastructure bill, and I forget offhand the name, it's you know, section five zero, blah, 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 blah. If it's not changed, basically kills DeFi in two years and is gonna put a pretty, fairly painful for NFTs too, right? Because it says you have to report within 10 days your counterparty for more than $10,000, so three ETH, right? Um, full KYC information, otherwise you're committing a felony. Well, a DeFi is just impossible, right? Because you, it's a liquidity pool. You don't know who your counterpart is. And so if that stays, DeFi is dead for U.S. citizens. And this will be committing felonies after felonies after felonies every time you go to Uniswap, which is bizarre. Right? Like, I mean, I understand kind of the thought process, but it's, it's pretty overkill, right? And then the other thing on NFTs, there at least you have a single individual counterparty. What it's going to mean that I think is inevitable, the big marketplaces are going to end up KYC, right? Because obviously if I'm buying a board Abe on OpenSea, I'm not going to be able to be like, hey guy, can you give me your driver's license so I can fill out this form to send it to the treasury to tell them I sent you 80 ETH. OpenSea is going to have to do it. And so for OpenSea is going to have to do it, they're going to have to KYC you. I mean, this is one of the reasons we've just got to solve this digital identity. It's not that complicated to have zero knowledge proofs of our identity behind an anonymous, whether it's an NFT, whatever, however we want to do it. So then we can pa pass effortlessly around the internet. And if the government wants to come and investigate us, there's a blockchain, they can figure it out. And it's just, it just stops all of this mess, right? It is, of course, the right answer. Zero knowledge proofs are the right answer to all these things. But I'm in Europe these days, and I met with a bank CEO. And I was whining about how many times a year, um, primarily organizationally, not in my personal life, I'm, I have had to send my utility bill and my ID card to everyone on the planet. Like, I feel like half the institutions in Europe know how many kilowatts I spent last month. Right? Yeah, and my assistant does this every week for me because somebody wants my KYC represented. It's, it's a nightmare. I mean, India solved it with India Stack. Now, it's not decentralized. I get it. But they solved it. You could do it with your fingerprint. Right. So, so I told him, like, look, you need to use zero knowledge proof for this. What you really need to know is that I live in this city and I'm a citizen of this country. You don't really need to know how much electricity I used last month, right? Like, I might as well have been talking like Mars language. <laughs> the state of banking infrastructure in Europe and what a zero knowledge proof is and how they're going to integrate with the banking infrastructure. It's leave aside there's not any political interest in doing this. Even if you, there was political interest, you're talking what, 10, 20 years for that to get integrated across those systems, right? But the bigger problem is there's no political will for it. If there was political will, of course, the U.S. and Europe have enough technical capacity to do great things. Today, and I don't know how much of this is misunderstanding or how much of it is, I mean, the elephant in the room, which I think needs to be discussed openly and needs to be discussed openly at a political level, and we have an adult discussion of it, I suspect the elephant in the room that they don't say out loud is that they feel for national security purposes, it's better that they have control of infrastructure, right? I mean, that's what's probably going on behind the scenes. But the, they expose themselves to the attack vectors. I mean, again, read that book. This is how they tell you the world will end. All you're doing by centralizing and being protective is making the exact mistake you're trying to stop, which is make yourself vulnerable. I agree with this, obviously. I 
I think countries are more robust if you do not generate a gigantic honeypot, right? <laughs> yeah, who'd have thought? Right, like, because that honeypot, you're, we described two different attack vectors on the honeypot. You're saying a hacker could do it. I'm saying a politician could do it. In any case, it's generally not a great idea to take all the resources of a country, put it in one specific place and say, here's the key to get everything. You own everything if you unlock this thing, right? And that's the type of discussion of the nature of, maybe you have more crime if you have courts and defense lawyers and maybe sometimes criminals get set free, right? If you let them defend themselves. Maybe sometimes someone who was actually guilty gets away with it because the state was not able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt they committed the crime, right? Of course that happens. But we have decided in a democratic society that the cost of that happening is lower than the cost of saying the state can just, well, I don't like the look of your face, I'm throwing you away, right? Because eventually, in the beginning, you might solve crime and then later will be abused. It's this class of issue. It's a constitutional rights class of issue. It's a due process class of issue. And the level of discussion about it is in no way up to the task of the magnitude of the importance of it, right? Like, you, you hear the type of stuff like, oh, it's money laundering. That's not the important point. Of course there's money laundering in the world, and of course it's better that there's less money laundering than more money laundering. But this is an architectural discussion. What is the right balance of various things and the right architectural, the right way to do it effectively? I have not seen any reasonable political debate about this so far. I don't know if you have, but I haven't. No, I have not. I don't think people grasp. Although I must admit, I have heard, bizarrely, the ECP starting to think somewhere in this. They're kind of think tank of people. Yes, there's a bunch of politicians who have their own agendas, but there's actually a bunch of smart people who are trying to tell them the right thing. Um, so it's there, but I don't know if anybody's listening. Yeah. Well, I don't, we have to, we have to, so I don't know, I view, uh, let me tell you what I think we need to do, right? And how I'm trying to do my part, but my part is the basis of everything that I do is like to see how many other people I can mobilize. It's not like I can do anything. I mean, I can do something, but the whole idea is to try and mobilize lots and lots of people that everyone does something in the general right direction. So bucket one, get people to use NFTs. doesn't matter what NFT. doesn't matter if it's an expensive NFT. I feel the feeling of like having a digital visual asset and moving around and owning it and putting a gallery and sitting someone is compelling to people. Even with the nuisance that it is now, it's compelling to people. Of course, it's better if we get the UX better. Of course, it's better if we onboard organizations like it sounds like you're going to do with your social tokens and get people to do it, right? Like, so the more the better. I am in favor of all NFT collections. I am in favor of all infrastructure providers. I am in favor of all wallets. The more the better, because after all this, we have like, I don't know, a million people using NFTs, which means it's nothing. No, it's a small trial. We, it's a small trial. We need to get to several billion. And, you know, the staging point's 100 million. So we got to onboard people. So that's number one. Number two, we have to get these ideas into the air and the ideas that there are actual constitutional due process important issues at stake here. It's not a bunch. The important issue, while it's important and sad if someone loses their money by losing their board ape, or if someone, I don't know, commits tax fraud or anything, those are normal issues. Those are like normal crime issues that people should deal with as normal crime issues. We have to have the important debate of in an increasingly digital society, in a society that will be like primarily digital in the 2030s, how should we architect that society? Should it be 10, cents, 10 big corporations in the government? Because I suspect in that world, we become some form of digital serfs. And I don't think, I mean, there might be some people in some government agencies who like that idea, but I don't think this is politically popular no, with voters. I, and I think you're right, because what happens, we're in a process of exponential change, and we are trying to use the past as a way to model how we operate in the future. And I'm not, as you say, 
I'm not really sure anybody's trying to be underhand or even slow. They just don't see the speed of which this is coming towards us and the yeah. magnitude of changes that are here. And I, I just don't think people have. I had a discussion with an MEP in Europe a, a month ago. And I was going on and on about my, we have to save the world through JPEGs and the metaverse, this type of thing. <laughs> and the MEP is extremely sophisticated about crypto, okay? As far as an MEP is concerned, right? Like, right, generally sophisticated. But for an MEP, off the charts. And the answer was like, oh, I mean, we Europeans aren't interested in that gaming stuff. We're interested in real life, right? And I'm like, oh, oh gosh, we have so much work to do, right? Like, this is an ally. This is someone who's like, believes in our objectives. This is someone who's like, been promoting crypto for many years in Europe. And it's like, oh, it's a Minecraft little thing, right? It's silly. Like, who cares about the silly stuff, right? Like, I, I remember when Twitter was having the discussion, like, I'm now just old enough to see patterns. Remember when Twitter was having the discussion because Fred Wilson was blogging about it, I think. Not Jack Wilson, right? Should it become a protocol or a service? And at the time, it seemed like, like a normal startup business decision. The decision made was totally sensible, right? Like, it's the safe choice, right? And Twitter back then was basically where tech bros in San Francisco said, I'm going out to lunch. Who, I mean, who cares really if it's protocol or service? And you fast forward to today, and suddenly, like, it's the arbitrator of global geopolitics somehow, right? But now it's too late. It's a public company. It has shareholders, what have you. It's very interesting, like, like, what could Jack even possibly do now? Nothing, right? It's too late, right? That ship has sailed. And so we're at that phase now, and this is, this is the part I spend all day and night thinking about, because by the time we get everyone on board to get everyone to your level of sophistication on NFTs and my level of sophistication on NFTs, it's going to be eight years from now, the path dependent story is going to have happened. And so it has to happen now. We need to scale up now. We need to have, and I'm going to say this, not to the crypto community, to the NFT community. The NFT community, which still because it came out of the creative professions, sometimes has mixed feelings about business, about scale, about money or whatever. That's right. They have to get past that. We cannot have an impact if we're just playing, if we're just playing a small game among ourselves. Eventually we'll just be like some niche thing, like the guys who are running their own Bitcoin nodes. It'll be there in the corner in our own world, but the rest of the world will head in another direction. And so everyone in NFT world who's a builder should you know, be trying to think how they get 10 and 50 times bigger in the next two or three years. Otherwise, it's not, I mean, we won't get there. The good thing is I am seeing people thinking of scale. I thought what Yuga did, now it's still small, it's still amongst NFT people, mm -hmm. but was interesting. And I like the fact that Timberland's building on top of it, creating music. And again, it's not really hit mainstream, but it feels like the shots are being taken and there are going to be some breakouts. I've been watching, you know, what Socios and Chili's have been trying to do with the football clubs. And there's not been a breakout because of how it's been approached. But there are, there are fires, little fires going on everywhere that could turn into the raging bonfire. And the more of these that get experimented with and the more people push, it's getting there. I, but you're right. We don't have long. Look, Yuga is... And, you know, you, uh, one has some track between the, like, I don't know, apes, punks, battle, whatever, right? Yuga as a business team is for sure the best performing business team in the space, right? Yeah. They they haven't made a wrong move yet. It's impressive. Correct. Right? So I I would, my remarks were not addressed at Yuga. They've gone from, like, zero to a multi-billion dollar business in less than 12 months. That is excellent hyperscaling, right? So that, they're doing great. The... The thing is, Yuga has a certain aesthetic, right? 
the metastatics can appeal to certain people. And they're trying to be uncontrollable and do a game and what have you. And that's fine. And that will work. But we need many swings at the bat. That's right. We need many yugas. We need many, um, I'm going to say metaverses, but really what I mean like is the metaverses, if I believe the metaverse is everything, which I do, then really what we're calling metaverses are just visualization layers, right? Like a, it's one way to do a decentral end and one way to do something yeah. else. And, and so I think there, there is room for, dip, you know, the metaverses have all been land first. And that's a good model, and it's been a very lucrative model, and I think lots of people should try that, and it's like Yuga's going to try that. I think there's room for a different model. We're going to try something else at 6529, because A, because everyone's trying land-based models, so that's covered anyway. But I'm not 100% convinced that's the right framework. I don't think you know, so. It's what, it's, it has the feeling of, you know how the first TV shows were just radio shows, but the camera pointed at the radio exactly. posts? Exactly. Physical location is not an and not a thing in the metaverse, right? So you like, teleport everywhere. So I don't care if you build a house next to Snoop Dogg; it doesn't matter, right? I mean, maybe I want a house next to Snoop Dogg anyway. But like the idea that you start that the experience starts with a bunch of raw land, and then you have to like figure stuff out seems backwards, right? Yeah. Like the experience should start with like something you actually might want to do, and then you know maybe that then drives value to different coordinates in that space, and so. We're going to run a bunch of experiments in that direction. I think that's interesting. I think, you know, we need to keep building bridges to the the rest of the world, right? Like, one of the things, so people asked me this six months ago, because we launched a fund, right? And so like, but isn't that the institution? So I'm like, yeah, it is an institution. It's, it's, it's rich people, right? Like, rich people are messed up. And like, well, is that... Contra or towards the ethos. That's right. And I said, well, here's how I think about it. I might be wrong, but this is how I think about it. Are rich people going to succeed in buying NFTs? Yes, they are. Right? Like, like the, it's a decentralized system and rich people are pretty good if they think if we think NFTs may be an exciting business opportunity and will go up in value. Rich people are going to succeed one way or another, right? And then the question is, well, how is it going to happen? By default, it'll be like some trad five people or some ex Goldman Sachs people or whatever, and they'll do a fund, and it will be, it will start with those values. And so, first issue is, well, I'd rather have it run by all pure NFT natives, right? The whole team there is like, like all these superstar NFT natives, like Barad and BSY and Han and AC. So culturally, they'll be more in tune, and then. What my not very secret plan is, because I tweeted it and I told it to LPs, I'm hoping in time we solve some of the securities law stuff and there's some way you can tokenize the collection time and then keep it in a decentralized space. So like my own collection, the 6529 Museum, I've said I'm never selling it and it's never going into centralized space. It's my skin in the game. If I, I am now just mansplain for the last half an hour and a half on why decentralization is so important. If I am then like, cool, let's sell this to Mark Zuckerberg, like, I don't know, it's just embarrassing. Like, it'll be embarrassing, right? So, I, I'm i saying this should stay in decentralized spaces. I control it. I can make that decision, and it's going to stay there. And then my not very secret plan, again, I tweeted it, is to get a whole bunch of other institutions, you know, I bought a bunch of NFTs and I'm fortunate that I could buy it a lot. And then I ran out of money and they, I got some of my friends to give me some money with the exciting proposition of, I said, oh, what are you going to do with the money? We're going to buy NFTs. I said, oh, that's great. And then later we're going to sell them for more money. I said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. I said, oh, oh, we're going to sell all the NFTs together. No, no, we're not going to do that either. Well, what are we going to do with them? Fractionalize the ownership of them. <laughs> we're just going to stick them in the centralized space. Well, yeah, but where are we going to get our money back? I'm like, don't worry about it. We'll figure that out later. Right now, we need to move cultural icons into decentralized spaces. It is better that they live in a decentralized space. I don't care which one. We'll figure out there'll be a vast set of experiments across everything from decentralized to you get to 20, 30, 50 that will come on which visualizations work. Eventually, some of them are going to work. And then we'll want to spend time. And so 
these important cultural objects if it's important for the United States to have the Statue of Liberty, right? It's important for 6529 community to have a summer JPEG. We need these cultural objects. They can't all, should not all just end up in the hands of like the richest trend family. And then, okay, the model of like, my friend's giving me money and then I'm telling them I'm not even giving it back has some limits eventually. And so I said, <laughs> and so I said, okay. You've well, got tolerant friends so far. That's all I can say. I, oh, the, the first ones who sent me money, ETH actually, are permanently on the like the the good list, right? They're they're on the good Christmas list for the rest of their lives because literally the proposition was, hey bro, I need like some ETH. I'm out of uh, money. I've, I've wasted out of money on monkeys. Yeah, I, I I wasted like eight figures on JPEGs. <laughs> And the most important thing in my life right now, I'm calling in all my chips and my friends. We need to buy more JPEGs. You understand? Like it's super, super important. We gotta buy more JPEGs. And they're like, "Oh, cool!" cool. Like, and so what? When do you need it? Like in a month and six months? Like tomorrow? Like a couple of million bucks in ETH by tomorrow would be really great. Just, well, is there a company? Like, just send it. You see this this address? Just send your ETH here. And what are we going to do with it? Are we going to make our money? Well, I don't know. I'll, I'll set up a company, something we just, right now I need to eat because I got to buy this JPEG. Because, you know, last summer, I think I kind of, as a collector, I broke out of the sea on generative art. That's probably my relatively strongest area, right? And in like August or September, I was running around for some like top generative art pieces, but as was Suzu and a certain very wealthy European. Right, a friend, a mutual friend. I can a mutual friend, a mutual friend, and yes. we're going after the same pieces. And I was feeling pretty sorry for myself because I got like billionaires on one side and billionaires on the other side. And like sometimes I'd find the piece and I'd want it. And well, by the way, them, to make you feel better, that our mutual friend called me up one day. He goes, "Fuck, I've got no money left. I need to start selling houses." <laughs> so you're not the only one who. He uh, ran out. Uh, sometimes they're like, hold on, seller. I'm looking for ETH. And then our mutual friend would just come and body me. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. So, you know, the, those guys that were there early, like, I owe them. But it was interesting. So let me say, like, how, how do you scale this? Because, like, me just putting my money and then my friend's money doesn't scale. And then I said, I have an open with LPs. Like, if I don't find a solution to permanently keep you in a decentralized space in 10 years, whatever, we'll solve them, we'll give you your money back, right? But I think I'll find a solution. I've got a decade. I've got a fun life of a decade. I'll find a solution. And then you can unlock large amounts of money. We have to, you can't say, we cannot say as a field, how much is Meta saying they're spending on Metaverse every year? Yeah, I can't remember. It's t tens of billions. It's just some extraordinary number, right? And so... We can't say, oh, yeah, we're going to build our own decentralized metaverse and we're going to spend like, I don't know, $100 million. The other guy's going to spend $10 billion, but ours is going to be better. And the other guy's starting with like 3 billion daily users and we're starting with like 200,000 daily users. Like none of that's going to work, right? It's not going to work. We have to scale up. We have to do things. We have to like bring all our friends on board and then bring everyone else on board and then convince companies and artists and sports teams and universities to issue NFTs, not like some other goofy thing, and then bring capital providers on board, but try and find a solution to keep them on the decentralized side, keep them on the, that it's important to them and maybe their future generations that maybe the world does not become an oligopoly run by 10 firms, right? Like, I don't think that's a good outcome. And I have, I, I should say this, I have no problem with any of the tech firms. They've done a wonderful job. They're incredible businesses. And what I would highly encourage them, they could change the course of history and solve this in an instant by themselves committing to open standards. Because if they all commit to open standards, then it's game over and I can six, five to nine can retire. 
I mean, I'm I'm having those conversations with people. It's early, but I'm having them because of you know, and I can't disclose any of this. Yeah, of course. Um, but by the stuff that I'm doing, I think there is a chance there. There is a crack in the window that I can get a crowbar in and potentially open it. The other one that I've looked at that I thought is maybe the easy way is NFT ticketing. Yes, it's a good one. Because everybody understands the idea of having your ticket on your phone. Yep. And if all you have to do is make some easy wallet that, you know, if you come to this, you know, concert by whoever it is, you have to download this and do that. Most music fans will do that. They will do a little bit of pain to have the unique experience of owning that NFT. That could be millions, and it can it can happen pretty quick. So that's just another attack vector for you. I, I, look, I we didn't talk about this because I think it's less disruptive, but I'll flag it since you mentioned it. We will also have NFTs representing every other type of off-chain object, real-life object, it's just going to take longer because you need the bridge to off chain. And so yeah. hotel rooms, the sports tickets, uh, ad time on electronic billboards, uh, sponsorships of stadiums, all of these things are going to become NFTs. Yeah. And, you know, one of the examples I give people that I think is interesting, like, let's say you were, were late in planning your European August vacation, right? And you want, for some reason, you decide you want to go to the Mediterranean in mid-August or like everyone on the planet wants to go to the Mediterranean. <laughs> no, you right? never do that. That's Americans right. do but, that. Right. But let's say you did. Well, so do all the Europeans. That's why it's full. <laughs> yeah, true. Right? And and then you start calling hotels and they're like, oh, well, we're sold out. You're an idiot. You should have called like two months ago. Listen, are they actually sold out? Is there not your wealthy man is it likely that there's not some elderly couple in Manchester that's booked a hotel room in Barcelona and they paid 300 euros for it? And if you gave them 600 euros for it, they would happily come back in September because they're retired. They don't, sure. but you only had that week off, right? It's a great but idea. There's, there's no way to make that trade because all that information, nobody has it. Their reservations and a lot of bunch of reservation systems and booking.com or the hotel reservations are there's no practical way that you can ask them. Because they're, they're central it's these are centralized. So we see it with hotel rooms. Obviously, it's there's a centralized algorithm. If you made that, as you're saying, a distributed algorithm, then we've got a market clearing mechanism that is decentralized. It's 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 a great idea. Right. Imagine on open sea it's the whatever, W Barcelona. Is there W in Barcelona? I assume it's W Barcelona. Yeah, there is. There room, is. Right. Room 302 these nights. I booked it because I wanted it. But also, I have some reserve price that says, like, you know, if someone gave me 700 bucks a night for this thing, I can go somewhere else. I don't want to go to Barcelona. Right. And uh, for 700 bucks, I'll go somewhere else. And suddenly, you will take something from being. It's just the same example as the galleries, right? The galleries have this completely fragmented, subscale, semi-pointless order book, right? And then you have a global order book. The hotels have these subscale, fragmented, I don't know how many hotels in the world, but tons, right? Their order book is spread across hundreds of thousands of hotel databases, right? And you could make it public. And then you say, I can see the global reserve price for a night in Barcelona at any type of hotel, on any type of floor, at any night, all the inventory, right? And I use hotel rooms as an easy example to visualize. This applies to everything, all off-chain assets. Yeah, and right now, for example, um, I'll never forget, there was that that event in, in Coachella Valley, which was the desert trip, and it was the Rolling Stones, and it was... Um, Roger Waters, and it was Bob Dylan. It was all of these, everybody together in one place, Paul McCartney. So I went to buy tickets for it because I thought, well, you never see all these people together. And, you know, it was the great baby boomer event. I thought I should attend just to, uh, to, to, to see the whole spectacle. So I tried to buy tickets. And on StubHub, you have your eyeballs ripped out. Ticket prices were trading 
with bid offer spreads of two thousand dollars. <laughs> and what it was basically was the high frequency market makers in the middle of that taking these massive spreads. Yep. yep. And you were not having a full market clearing event because only there was an a, there was basically an oligopoly of who was allowed to make prices. Yep. And it was it was abusive. And that whole system, if it was done in this different way, when you've got, you know, liquidity providers, liquidity pools and AMM, before you know it, you've really created an efficient market. The one I've been looking into is time. So, you know, many people ask me for some of my time or you for some of your time. And there are ways that you could tokenize that time. So therefore the market bids for that time and you can decide whether you want to release that time. There are inefficient ways of doing that, but there are efficient ways as well where you can actually clear market time for people. And it actually becomes a way of organizing corporations. So at a corporation, the higher up you are, the more time um, demands that you have. But also you can also be somebody who's uh, really in demand because you're doing too many projects at once and you're good at your job, and you've got all of these people wanting your time. If you're time traded freely within the corporation, you allocate resources effectively, and you prioritize. It's, there's some really interesting stuff around all of this. Well, this is the very interesting saying that like, even in capitalist economies, most of the activity in corporations happens in a communist system, right? Like there's no, like the, the edges of the corporation and the edges of the corporation consumers operate in a capitalist economy, but the internal operations of any large organization have no price signals, none, right? And so, or very, very kind of gross once a year, let's do your performance review. Oh, what did you try and convince me that you're better than the other person at your level and they'll give you 2,000 bucks a year raise or something. There's no markets, right? And this is, I have a good friend from the first go around in, um, in crypto Twitter, um, who I'm not going to dox, but it's very well known. And about a month after I booted up 6529, he DM'd 6529, not knowing it's me, and saying, hey, I'm really interested in these things you're saying about NFTs. Do you want to come over for dinner? I was laughing. I'm like, that's enough a call. And he's like, wait, it's you? No way. That's... <laughs> It's incredible. But it's very, it's very funny. Within like a, a few months, all my other account friends followed me, started DMing me. It's interesting, right? Like that's, I hope that was interesting. But anyway, what I started saying is like, NFTs are obviously trivially going to be vastly bigger than fungible tokens, right? They're going to be vastly bigger because on the one hand, they're the way you can represent arbitrarily the metaverse. Right. And also they're the way once you have bridges to the on chain, off off chain world, they can represent all assets in the world. And the world in general is non fungible. The only thing that is fungible in the world are financial instruments. Everything else is non fungible. And now we have a model to represent the world at large in a digital way, composable ownership, transportation, financialization, all these things. Well, it's trivially the case that they're gonna be bigger than fungible tokens. And today they're like 2% the market cap of fungible tokens. And I'm like, uh, come on, this is like ridiculous. This is the single mis biggest mispricing in financial markets in the world right now. Okay, so we get cut to the chase because you and I, I can clearly talk for about six hours together. Yeah. Okay, so everyone gets this now. You've just let, it's 2% of the current market, which is I think gonna grow 100X anyway. So yep. this is ridiculous, right? A ridiculous it's opportunity. Ridiculous. How does somebody, how does the average person, and don't say just buy something because, you know, we've all bought something and most things are worth nothing. What is Correct. the single best way? Is it by saying, uh, thing, I'll buy some of the blockchains? Because no, I, I, have a, I have an answer to this. Go on then. I have an answer to this. The, my, and this is based on watching my friends, uh, crypto civilians, manage their crypto exposure over the last eight years, right? And the reality is most versions of go buy something, anything, end in disaster, right? Most, I've told so many people since 2013, buy Bitcoin, right? And a lot didn't, but even the ones that did, somehow managed to lose money on it, right? So 
the which is incredible, right? But so my advice on the buying side tends to be very conservative relative to anyone on. I'm like, look, you should put an amount. I tell people, look, if they want fungible tokens, buy the major ones in small quantities over time. Um, assume your NFTs are going to buy are going to go to zero, right? Like that, uh, being a most NFTs are not going to be a good financial investment. And for someone who's not deeply into the NFT space, buying NFTs as a way to fund your retirement is likely to end in tears also. And for normal people who are not used to the volatility of crypto, the best thing they can do is allocate a small amount of their net worth to it. And I tell them, allocate it and assume it's gone to zero. And when they look at me shocked, I say, okay, whatever number you had in mind was too much. Just drop the number, because otherwise what's gonna happen the next time it nukes 75% they're gonna sell, right? And it's definitely gonna nuke 75%. NFTs in particular feel like, you know, altcoins in 2013, right? Like I spent a year and a half in NFTs. I look at Bitcoin and Ethereum now, they look like a treasury bond, they're so stable, right? <laughs> and so the, the best thing people can do is educate themselves because the number of career opportunities in the space are going to be infinite. And whatever level you are in your career, you're junior, you're mid, you're senior, you're an entrepreneur, you're a lawyer, you're a accountant, you're a graphic designer, almost certainly your career path, your opportunities, your income stream by orienting to this space are gonna be better. And along the way, if you start doing things, you will get smarter about the space naturally, and then you'll make better decisions. You can't short circuit the fact that even, I mean, I consider myself quite sophisticated in crypto, and half the time I wonder if I know what I'm doing, right? Yeah. And I've spent thousands of hours. And so the idea that there's like some type of free lunch that you can tell someone, go, there's, the only free lunch I would say is probably dollar cost averaging into, I don't know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, something else, and buy NFTs for fun. That's probably close to a free lunch, but over long periods of time and with huge drawdowns and whatever. So there's no free lunch of that type, I think. What is, though, a great idea is spend time on it because the single biggest, and this has always been the problem with crypto. It's been the problem for eight years, it's a problem today. The ideas are there, we're short of people. And so yeah. if you are, I don't know, a, a bookkeeper, but you know how to read Etherscan, your hourly billing rate is going to triple. This is dead right. It's dead right. right. And this, so it's scarce instead of telling, and unlimited demand. Correct. So instead of telling that bookkeeper out of the 5% of his salary he saved to go buy some tokens, right? My advice is learn how to read Etherscan, say, hey, I can do crypto bookkeeping and your whole salary is going to triple. And then if you want to take some of that, because now you're in the space and you see the rush and buy some things, then it's fine. But yeah, I mean, my view has been that this is the biggest change of global business model we've seen in multiple hundreds of years. So if that is the case, exactly as you're saying, just go with the tide. Just yeah. educate, educate yourself and suddenly your value, your actual net worth goes up. I mean, it's hilarious, right? But that's as simple as that. You educate yourself in this space, your net worth goes up because your future opportunity set goes up because it's moving exponentially. That's exactly right. And you know, one of the things that people underestimate is the value of starting part-time on the side. Okay. A lot of people look at it and say, well, I don't know, am I going to leave my secure life better than go into the space? And scary, right? Okay, do a little bit. Spend a few hours on it. Build up, supplement your current income at first, right? Hmm. Spend, and then as you get into the space, then maybe one day the opportunity will come, whether it's, whether your life orientation is you want a job or your life orientation is you're entrepreneur, you want to start a business. If you spend time in this rapidly expanding space, eventually you're going to see something that is likely a better expected value for your life than being in an industry that's growing at 5% a year, right? I've worked in industries of all types. There's nothing more painful 
than working in an industry that's slowly shrinking. You I, work I, yeah. just as hard as in everything else, maybe harder, and you just can't win. It's just this dog fight with your competitors on who can like grab the straps. So it's just painful. There's, not, there's nothing fun about it. And so the economy does give us these price signals and they say, look, we apply your resources over, apply your labor over here. I think that's interesting. I mean, I, I mean, this was basically the fundamental principle for which I set up Real Vision Crypto, the whole thing. Because I've been following this space like you, I felt passionately about it, and I thought people need to understand how big a thing this is. And so I created, a, you know, the rest of Real Vision subscription-based. But we did it for free because it is a massive hack to understand what this is. Because if we got the fastest adoption of any technology in all history, it's growing at 185% a year, and you get some information, well, you're now a rarity. You're a rare PFP, and we all know how valuable those are. Exactly. Exactly. Listen, my friend, amazing conversation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I knew I would. Um, and I really appreciate your time. You've spent a lot of time here helping us think all this through. And um, I think people find it super helpful. Well, thank you for having me. This was a real pleasure. I mean, I feel like we are basically 100% aligned in how we see the world conceptually. And so it's been fun to talk about it. Hopefully this is, hopefully someone will listen to the discussion and it will help change their life in some positive direction. And then that's, that's the best we can hope for. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure we will speak again. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey there, visionaries. Your free membership to Real Vision Crypto, the world's premier source for cryptocurrency and digital asset analysis, is available right now at realvision.com forward slash crypto.